Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. New details on the delayed police response in Uvalde. Why investigators believe the school district's police chief waited to enter the classrooms and the information he reportedly had when that decision was made. And we're going behind the kitchen door at two San Antonio restaurants. The discoveries that earned both businesses a second inspection. And ways to make sure your AC doesn't go a wall. Tips from the pros on ways to stay cool and maybe save some cool cash as well. But first, we start with late breaking news. One man in an area hospital, another on the run from police after a shooting on the southwest side. This all happened before 8 o'clock off of Gwenda Lee near Old Pearsall Road. San Antonio police are saying that a 40 year old man went to a neighbor's home where he was shot in the chest during an argument while having an argument with a 20 year old man. The San Antonio Police Department says the suspect was last seen in a white Honda. Police are talking with at least five witnesses. Officers do believe the suspect is still armed. This is an ongoing investigation, and of course, we will keep you updated. Tonight, a revealing and damning report raises more questions about police response in Uvalde. An article published today in the New York Times says that Uvalde CISD Police Chief Pete Arredondo knew that there were people alive in the classrooms where the shooter was holed up, but he still waited more than an hour to send armed officers inside. This article comes more than two weeks after the shooting at Robb Elementary, where details of the police response have changed back and forth since May 24th. We're also learning that state lawmakers received an update from the director of the Texas Department of Public Safety today. The night team's Patty Santos joins us now with the latest in this developing story. And Patty, this article and the DPS director's report explain more about Chief Arredondo's decision. Please break it down for us. Yes, Stephanie, state investigators believe that delay comes down to protecting police. That is according to an official brief on today's closed door presentation in Austin who spoke to ABC News. They believe Arredondo was waiting for protective gear to arrive. One transcript transcript reportedly quotes Arredondo as saying, quote, people are going to ask why we're taking so long. According to the New York Times timeline, the first 911 call from Rob Elementary came in at 11.30 a.m. A teacher reported seeing the suspect near the school with a gun. DPS says he fired several shots at the building two minutes later and entered a pair of adjoined classrooms at 11.33 a.m. Police officers entered the school at 11.35. Two officers who approached the door to the classroom were grazed by bullets. The New York Times article cites several documents from law enforcement and video footage. The footage reportedly shows Arredondo first discussing breaching the classrooms almost an hour into the shooting around 12.21 p.m. But a transcript says he wanted to find the keys for the door. The Times reports several officers voiced concerns about wanting to go in as 911 calls continued to come in. Several calls were made from the classrooms the shooter entered. The Times says a Uvalde CISD police officer got a call from his wife saying she had been shot. We know one of the victims, Eva Mirales, was married to a district police officer. And a Border Patrol tactical unit finally breached the classroom door at 12.50, one hour and 17 minutes after the first shots were fired at the school. Chief Arredondo broke his silence tonight in a new interview with the Texas Tribune. He defended his actions and says his department's efforts to clear the other classrooms saved lives. You can read that article right now on KSAT.com. We have made our own request to interview Chief Arredondo, but so far... He has declined. The decision to wait for protective gear goes against active shooter training for most police departments. A Uvalde CISD police officer and supervisor taught in active shooter training just two months before the school shooting. Training records obtained by case at 12 defenders show participants were encouraged to use, quote, immediate decisive action. Steve, Stefania. Patty, thank you. And let's go back to that Times report because here's what else we're learning. Some of the first officers on the scene had long guns and we're also learning that Chief Arredondo tried to speak to the gunman through the classroom doors after he learned his name. 
Tonight we continue to remember the victims of that mass shooting today. A visitation held for Eva Mireles. She was one of the teachers killed during that shooting at Robb Elementary. Family and friends say she would light up a room with her smile. She'll be laid to rest tomorrow. A visitation ceremony will also be held for Alexandria Rubio tomorrow. Lexi wanted to attend St. Mary's University to play softball and attend law school. Her funeral is set for Saturday. Tonight, a Southside nonprofit is honoring the victims from Rob Elementary. This evening, Fuerza Unida held a silent candlelight vigil at its headquarters on New Laredo Highway. The group's director says that she's tired of the suffering and losing innocent children. She's also hoping there's a solution for gun violence. Judge Rosie Speedland Gonzalez was a guest speaker at the event. Here's what she said. Well, tonight, the country dealing with yet another mass shooting, this one at a Maryland manufacturing plant. Authorities are reporting at least three people were killed. It happened at a plant in Smithsburg that's just west of Baltimore. It's still unknown why the gunman opened fire or how many people were shot. Officials say he shot a state trooper in the shoulder. The state trooper ret returned fire, hitting the gunman. Now, nationally, lawmakers are pushing for gun reform. The House passed a gun reform package today. The Protecting Our Kids Act would raise the age to buy semi-automatic rifles to 21 and ban large capacity magazines. House lawmakers also passed a red flag bill. That measure would temporarily keep people who are a danger to themselves or others from having access to guns or ammunition. However, those bills are unlikely to pass the Senate, but Lawmakers are hoping that leaders can reach some sort of a middle ground and get something passed. I'm optimistic in the next couple of weeks uh, that uh, we'll have something for Senator Schumer to put on the floor that will pass with uh, significant bipartisan majorities. So how did they vote? Let's take a look at how local representatives voted on this most recent round of gun legislation. Today, the House voting on the red flag laws along party lines. By the way, the lawmaker representing Uvalde is Tony Gonzalez. He voted against that bill. The Republican also voted against the Protecting Our Kids Act. The vote for this bill for Texas U.S. representatives was also along party lines, as you can see. Now, last night, Representative Gonzalez released a statement about why he voted against the Protecting Our Kids Act. The congressman says in part, quote, my job is to represent the people of Texas's 23rd congressional district. My constituents want real solutions like access to mental health services and improved school safety. That's why I'm laser focused on having serious bipartisan discussions around legislation that will address the root causes of violent and heinous crimes, end quote. Switching gears now after tomorrow, the city of San Antonio will no longer accept applications for its rental, mortgage, and utility assistance. That program helps people with financial hardships during the pandemic, but that hardship doesn't have to be tied to COVID necessarily. Now, those who qualify based on income can receive one-time assistance, and you could submit your applications through the city's website. And just by the way, the application, the deadline tomorrow is for 1159 tomorrow night. Dead insects in the kitchen and several repeat violations were bad news for a Northwest Side restaurant. Yeah, the night team's Tim Gerber dropped by to see how that restaurant is doing right now in tonight's Behind the Kitchen Door. When inspectors visited Real Pho, located in the 11,200 block of Petranco, they found all kinds of violations, including five repeats. Their refrigerators were running warm, showing a temp of 50 when it should be 41 or lower. They were also missing thermometers. The inspector found dead roaches and flies in the kitchen that needed to be cleaned up. So did a lot of other things, including the insides of all the freezers and refrigerators and the ventilation hood, which hadn't been cleaned since December of last year. It was full of grease and food debris. The restaurant earned a failing score of 69, a big drop from their last inspection in January when they earned an 81. Hi, I'm Tim with KSAT 12. Yeah. Um, I stopped by this week to see what happened. Recent. You guys got a pretty low score on this one last time. Uh, have you guys been able to, to fix the violations that were on there? Oh, yes, we, we tried to fix it, yeah. I just to took over the, the restaurant, yeah. Yeah, were yeah. you surprised by the score? Oh, uh, yes. 
the owner took me behind the kitchen door to show me they have corrected the violations. Metro Health ordered a reinspection, but the owner says they haven't returned. Kong's Express, located in the 900 block of Zarzamora, came in with a score of 74. The inspector saw cooked chicken waiting to be recooked inside a non-working refrigerator. Food containers were dirty with food debris and the ice machine had mold-like debris inside. The manager on site couldn't properly explain the wash, rinse and sanitizing process. There were cockroaches spotted stuck to a sticky trap and the AC vent above the food prep area was dirty with dust buildup. Eight violations were corrected at the time of the inspection, but Kong's still earned a reinspection. That's what's going on behind the kitchen door this week. I'm Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. You can catch Tim's BKD reports on Thursday nights right here on the Night Beat. Several restaurants also got perfect scores to see who did a good job. Just take your phone and scan that QR code on your screen, and it's going to take you right to our perfect scores database on KSAT.com. It's still ahead on the night beat. It is hot outside. That means you're going to need that AC. Mm -hmm. Hope you have it. After the break, some helpful tips on how to maintain your air conditioner this summer. Also, the latest on the baby formula shortage in the U.S. Where we're getting the latest shipment? Those details coming up next. Hey, your AC is going to be working overtime as we go through the weekend. Today, 99 the high temperature. It's that psychological boost. We didn't hit 100, but we did have four days in a row of uh, 100 degree heat. 99, that was our high today, and tomorrow is going to be a little bit warmer and then even hotter into the weekend. We'll talk about how hot it's going to get, the newest drought monitor, and what could trim temperatures back a bit in the extended forecast coming up. A primetime public hearing. It has been just over 18 months since the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Tonight, the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot held its latest hearings in primetime, sharing details of what happened that day with the U.S. public. That hearing, hearing aired right here on KSAT 12. Tonight's hearing featured videotaped depositions from President Donald Trump's family members, several people closest to his administration, and these newly released pieces of video also show what happened inside and outside the Capitol building that day as protesters clashed with U.S. Capitol Police. A Capitol Police officer also testified about the moment she was knocked unconscious. We started grappling over the bike racks. Um, I felt the bike rack come on top of my head and I was pushed backwards and my foot caught the stair behind me and I, uh, my chin hit the handrail and then I, at that point I had blacked out, but my, um, the back of my head clipped the concrete stairs behind me. That was the first time she was injured. She would come back and be injured again by rioters. Vice President Mike Pence also named several times tonight. Testimony shows Pence contacted the Pentagon to get the National Guard and other agencies to respond to defend the Capitol. President Trump did not. The U.S. just got a third shipment of baby formula. This latest round of formula was flown from Germany into the DFW airport earlier today. This is all part of Operation Fly Formula. Here's the thing, though. We are expecting more shipments in the U.S. The White House is trying to address a nationwide shortage of baby formula linked to a formula plant shutdown. The Michigan plant at the center of the crisis resumed production last week, so hopefully things will pick up. Yeah, with record highs this week, HVAC systems working overtime just to keep up. That's right. And if you're not careful, the scorching heat could really crash your system. You don't want that to happen. You don't want to get stuck with a broken no. AC when it's this hot. The night team's Patty Santos shows us how to keep it in tip top shape. That Texas heat is oppressive, terrible. There's only one real way to beat it. We use an AC. And AC repair companies are feeling the heat from this scorching week. Right now we're getting about 70 calls coming in. Daily calls for maintenance and repairs to San Antonio Air have doubled. Customers calling about systems just stop blowing cold air. Um, drains clogged up so they'll see uh, water dripping from their front porch or from their back porch or the front door. Before your HVAC gives out, make sure you have an expert. Give it an annual inspection. Here's 
some ways to prevent your system from working too hard. Switch out the filters every month, close the blinds or curtains in your home, turn on ceiling fans inside, and keep the exit doors closed. If trouble comes up, call a reputable company. If you can find a company that you trust and that can be there for you, right? Especially when you really need them. Uh, weekends, holidays, birthdays. Uh, typically when the AC is going to go out. A shortage of workers and some parts as well as inflation could also end up costing you more if you delay proper maintenance. Patty Santos, KSEC 12 News. All right, let's take a live view here. This is Sky 12 over Tower of America's right now, 88 degrees. Oh, what a lovely sight. If only we could bring those temperatures to the day side, but we're just going to have to deal with triple digit heat for a bit. Yeah, I think the 88 degree highs are behind us for a long, <laughs> long time, <laughs> long, long time. And ironically, I just had my AC service today. Got fixed. Good. Got fixed. Thank you, Charles, for that help. That was, that was a good fix. All right, so let's take a look at our heat advisory that's in effect tomorrow. Yeah, you'll need the AC cranked up. And uh, if you don't have it, I suggest the refrigerated meat aisle at HEB. That's my favorite place to be this time of year. And you can drool over the good meat. Anyway, uh, the heat advisory in effect tomorrow, because some air temps will be between 100 to 105 and the heat index, for a few hours in a few locations could get up to about 105 to 108. But for the most part, it's just another way of saying, hey, it's going to be hot again tomorrow and even hotter than today. 101 tomorrow, that'd be a record by one degree. Saturday and Sunday, 104. Saturday, it would tie a record. Monday, we trim back to 101, which would tie a record. And then possibly it looks like upper 90s again toward the middle and especially end of next week. So let's talk about it. Along with our weather pattern, of course, with the heat has been the drought, the newest drought monitor exceptional drought, which is the worst category. Southern Bear County toward Hondo, even Uvalde, Sabinaw Lake, Rock Springs up into the hill country and even stretch down toward Goliad. 70, 79% of the state is considered in drought. Panhandle getting some activity, some showers and even severe thunderstorms and even New Mexico, parts of northern Mexico. That's because the Big Blue H, the upper level high, it's basically right along the coastal bend here. And with the clockwise circulation around it, it actually helps aid the development of some of those showers and storms over the higher terrain of Mexico and New Mexico, but not for us. This is going to move around, waffle around a little bit through the weekend. I showed you it's still going to provide hot temperatures, 104 Saturday, Sunday. But then by the middle of next week, it moves eastward over the eastern U.S. And that basically opens the door for the steering flow off the Gulf of Mexico. So if we can drum up a disturbance or two to come in, you know, a little ripple in the upper level flow, it could stir things up a little bit. Also, it's going to trim back the high temperatures a tad back down to the upper 90s by the middle of next week. 89 right now, dew point of 68. So it feels like 93. Winds out of the southeast at 21. It's that muggy flow off the Gulf of Mexico. Same trend tomorrow. Very humid in the morning. Dew points low 70s and then down into the low to mid 60s by the afternoon. But that's still enough to give us a heat index about two to four degrees higher than the actual air temperature. Hence the heat advisory in effect. 90 now Castroville. South side at 88, Bulverde 87 degrees. For the most part, 80s, but you get closer to the Rio Grande and we're still in the lower 90s. Del Rio, for example, 93. Tomorrow morning, mid 70s by the afternoon, we're back above 100. By and large, we'll be above 100 degrees. 102 Stone Oak, Von Army, Elmendorf, 103, Lavernia 102, Castroville 103. Some low clouds early in the day. They actually helped us out today by sticking around a few extra hours. And then sunny and 91 by noon into the afternoon. We're talking 101 and still a dry forecast, at least for now. But at least the temperatures will trim back a little bit next week. Just a little bit. A little bit. A All psychological right. boost. Thank you, Adam. Our friend Larry. Sports next. Today I had all of it. I had the overhand curveball, had the sidearm curveball, sidearm fastball. I had a ball today and it felt amazing. The Hannah senior pitcher Ryan Hendry pitched a gym in the state title game and was named MVP in big board sports. Most of the Golden State Warriors did not practice today, instead using the time for rest and recovery. They lost Game 3 of the NBA Finals last night, 116-100, and trailed the Celtics two games to one. Steph Curry got hurt late in the fourth quarter last night when Al Horford rolled into his left leg while diving for a loose ball. Today, he was asked if he's a go for Game 4. I'm going to play. That's all, I, that's, all I, that's all I know right now. Uh, about ten and a half hours of sleep. 
couple of dunks in the ice bucket, and that's about it for now. And then take advantage of the day and tomorrow to get completely ready for the game. Last night was the first NBA Finals game in Boston since 2010, so the crowd of 19,000 plus at TD Garden pumped up the Celtics. You talked about it, coach. Definitely think we did. I mean, uh, when you got a uh, an environment like last night, it's kind of hard not to feed off. The energy was electrifying. It was uh, chaotic, um, and it was perfect for the timing of it. Game four is tomorrow night at 8, and you can watch it live right here on KSAT 12. The Hennis is back on top of the UIL Class 1A Baseball World after beating Nazareth in the state championship today. The bats come alive in the top of the fifth. Dalen Gonzalez knocks a base hit in the right field. Kobe Fortner scores and it's 2-0 to Hennis. The inning continues, this time Rain Redden drives a base hit right up the middle and Gonzalez rounds third and he will score. Part of a three-run inning for the Cowboys. They led 4-0 after five. Pitcher Ryan Hendry dominated on the mound, pitching a three-hit shutout and striking out six, including the final out. DeHennis wins the title 4-0, and the Cowboys can't help but feel like it's 2019 all over again. Kind of eerily scary how 19 and this year matched up with each other. We had a run rule in the semis and a shutout, and then we we both won four to nothing in the finals in shutouts. I mean, I, I really don't know how you can script that any better, uh, but I'll take it. It's hard to lose when you don't give up a run. So, I, I, you know, we might still be playing, but we can't lose. So I, I'm just proud of the way we played defense and pitched. It was awesome. Three years ago, I watched a video of Alex Majors pitch here and win it for Ihenis, and I said, I want to do that and get that last strikeout, and I did that, and it feels amazing. I'm so excited, so happy, just happy for my team, happy for myself, everybody. It's awesome. In 2019, DeHennis won both the baseball and softball titles just like they did this year. Next game is the UIL Class 2A State Championship. Shiner trying to complete an undefeated season against Valley Mills. Comanches get on the board first in the bottom of the second. Carson Shute grounds out the second base, but it's enough to plate Bryce Phillip, and Shiner leads 1-0. Valley Mills, though, would score the next four runs, and they beat Shiner 4-2 to win the 2A state title. The Reagan Rattlers baseball team got a huge send-off before hitting the road today. Fight 98 is their motto. The 98-mile trip to Dale Diamond to play in the Class 6A state tournament is exactly what they wanted. Every pitcher has thrown a bullpen this, this week. We're, we're ready for everyone to pitch just to get to Saturday. And the goal is to get to Saturday, and then you find out how to win on Saturday. Reagan and Rockwall Heath will play ball tomorrow night at 7 at Dell Diamond in Round Rock. Texas had to beat Oklahoma in Game 2 of the Women's College World Series tonight to keep their season alive. Top 5, Sooners' Kinsey Hansen hits a three-run homer and put the Sooners on top 6-2. to two. OU trailed 2-zip, but they come back to win 10-5 for their second straight national championship. Tony Parker's Heroes and Villains is next after the break. Spurs great Tony Parker is lending his private collection of life-size statue, statues at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Called Tony Parker's Heroes and Villains, it features more than 40 pieces and runs tomorrow through September 4th. He's got Iron Man, Wonder Woman, and Batman, to name a few. So is Tony a DC or Marvel guy? Well, I'm more a Marvel guy, that's for sure. Uh, my favorite is Iron Man. Uh, that's my favorite character. Uh, my favorite statue here is the big Hulkbuster because of the story behind it, because it took 10 of us to, to carry everything and, and to assemble it. Parker said he hopes people will enjoy his collection. The San Antonio Missions will wear Uvalde High School baseball jerseys on Thursday, June 16th to be auctioned off. The proceeds go into the Rob School Memorial Fund. The jersey design is a replica of the ones worn by the Uvalde Coyotes High School baseball team. Fans in attendance at Wolf Stadium on June 16th will be able to bid on the game-worn jerseys during the game. And the auction ends 15 minutes after the final out. Great gesture yep. by the Missions. By the way, Tony Parker has an Iron Man. Does he have an L Ram? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the blanks. We'll be right back after this. For all of us at KSAT 12, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you tomorrow.